Next, Mount Vernon's fascinating history includes a fist fight with an unusual prize. Then we'll go downtown where entire blocks, not just individual buildings, are being restored. And then see how old barns are being repurposed as new buildings. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by... At American Electric Power, we've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarters city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State Auto Insurance Companies, transforming to become a digital provider of auto, home, and business insurance. And for nearly 100 years, committed to the people and neighborhoods of Central Ohio. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation. Smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri. Your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated. It just needs to be right. CODA. Keeps our community moving forward. Falgren Mortime Marketing and Communications. Think wider. Ohio Health focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities. Women in Philanthropy at Ohio State, changing lives by giving together. And by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you. You can't say that Mount Vernon is a Columbus neighborhood, but for many of us, it's about an hour away. And as you'll see, it's worth making the trip for a lot of reasons. See, Mount Vernon has a fascinating history, and like a lot of small Midwest towns, it's facing many challenges. In fact, you might say that Mount Vernon is all about history, hope, and renewal. Mount Vernon was founded in 1805, and they needed a county seat in 1808. And so some inspectors were sent up from the state government to choose a site. And it was between Mount Vernon and a town called Clinton, which was just north of here. The story goes that the inspectors came to Mount Vernon to check it out and it was a great little town and there were people that were tending to gardens and pulling up stumps and improving the city to make it a nice place. And of course they marked all that down and thought, what a great little town. And then they uh, ventured on to Clinton to look there and the, the story goes that those same people rode north ahead of, of the inspectors and uh, got in a fight on purpose to make Clinton look like this rowdy uh, frontier town that was uncivilized. And so Mount Vernon naturally was awarded the county seat. There's a Clinton Road and that's all that's left of, of Clinton. Mount Vernon grew very rapidly in the early years. Settlers came where they could produce farms. Once they produced agriculture, they needed to get that to markets. Once that happened, we had transportation centers building up, and that attracted more population and needed consumer goods. My great-grandfather and his brother, we say we started out selling flour and sugar out of barrels and whiskey and dynamite. Then they opened the Wilson Tea and Spice Company in Toledo, Ohio. They also opened at several retail stores. This store was opened in 1897, and it's remained here in this block that whole time. Well, back at the turn of the century, the spices were like money. They were really rare and hard to find. The Wilson Spice Company at one time was the largest wholesalers of tea and spices in the United States. By the late 1800s, it really grew into an industrial city. The industry was early on uh, mills near the river. There were something like 13 oil and gas companies. There's actually a, a lot of silica sand, which is great for making glass. So we had six glass companies here in the city. Well, the glass industry here dates to the early 20th century. Jacob Coxey retrieved uh, carloads of steel from the 1893 World's Fair in Chicago with the intention of building a steel casting uh, company in Mount Vernon. Worked at that uh, through about 1905 when he hit upon hard times and poor quality and ultimately sold his concern to an upstart 
uh, glass organization that had some ties to Pittsburgh Plate Glass. Uh, by 1908, the company had totally become owned by the Pittsburgh Plate Glass Company. One of the innovations of the glass industry in Mount Vernon was the Penn Vernon glass process. Glass was drawn as a ribbon of glass out of a vat of molten steel, cooling as it rose, and very skilled cutters, most of them of Belgian origin, would cut this glass at the top of these towers. These factories ran, obviously, 24-7. It was the largest sheet glass factory in the world, more than a million square feet of factory space, shipping sheet glass all over the world. Mount Vernon Bridge Company was founded in the late 1800s. It lasted until about 1960, where they built bridges that they shipped all around the country. There's bridges that span the Mississippi River. Steel from the Mount Vernon Bridge Company was used in construction of Ohio Stadium and St. John Arena and the Neal House Hotel, uh, all in Columbus. Certainly the presence of two major railroad lines in our community were important, not only to the glass industry, but certainly to agriculture, which is a major industry then and now in our community. And I think they tell a great story of the importance of transportation in a remote rural community that we were able to have not only a glass industry, but heavy industry and agriculture side by side. And uh, at the time that those developed in the, in the early 19th century, we have to remember that Ohio and Mount Vernon was really a gateway to the developing, you know, western regions of our country. Cooper starts with two brothers in 1833. They had three horses and they sold two of them in order to open their first mill. So it was a one horse operation. Over time, they expand and get into engines and become one of the premier engine makers in the country. Uh, they pioneer the traction gear in 1875, which basically invented the tractor. They built engines bigger and bigger. Uh, I've had people tell me some of those, a man could stand inside the pistons. They were that large. Of course, there were lots of uses for big engines. The greatest one, of course, being locomotives, steam power. People realized that steam power could then be used for equipment on farms, the most important of which was the threshing machine. The big thing that became for Cooper Bessemer was compressor engines for cross-country pipelines. They moved their headquarters to Houston, Texas, unfortunately, and were sold to Rolls-Royce and then sold to Siemens. And unfortunately, after 215 years in business in Mount Vernon, they're closing down. Mount Vernon has an, an opportunity to take this old industrial site that's I think it's about 50 acres or so, and we're probably not gonna get the large company that moves in and moves a thousand workers here, but we could get 20 smaller companies. It's on a rail line, it's, it's got all the infrastructure ready, it's close to downtown. Uh, this is a big opportunity for the city to keep adapting like it's done over time to avoid some of those rust belt type troubles that cities undergo. The cost of old buildings in downtown Mount Vernon is relatively small compared to the cost of renovating. It's difficult to find a, in a city of this size a, a good commercial use for the buildings and to renovate the buildings to get a return on investment. But for the colleges, and most, for the most part, it was cheaper to renovate buildings and utilize those buildings for their purposes than perhaps to build new buildings on their campuses. And also I think that each of the colleges and universities wanted to be a part of downtown Mount Vernon. We are now seeing restaurants and tap rooms and retail of all sorts developing. Just what everybody's looking for now, they're coming back to their neighborhoods. They're building cities so that everybody has a corner store and you know, a corner pub and all that sort of thing. Well, that's what we are. We don't have to build it, we just have to restore it and get it up and running. This community is rich in many different ways. You think of green space developments, um, development with Aerial Foundation Park. The old gravel pits were seen along with the Pittsburgh Plate Glass Company, old factory site, were seen as an opportunity to really think about intentional repurposing off the side of downtown. Thanks to the generosity of Karen Bookwald Wright and the Aerial Corporation, we were able to acquire this property and uh, that was really the beginning of unleashing a great creative energy 
we decided this was going to be the area where we we're going to celebrate our industrial heritage. So as you walk through this park, you're going to see girders from the original Coxie Steel plant. Hiking trails, there's event space, we have community concerts there. There's a river of glass made from the cast-offs of glass called Cullet. This 250-acre park is an absolutely amazing example of what a local community can do when it pulls together to create a vision for economic vitality. This is a very exciting time in downtown Mount Vernon. Next, downtown Mount Vernon, where restoration is a block party. Then, old barns see new life thanks to some lofty plans. We're at the Woodward Opera House in Mount Vernon, but we're not going to show you much of it just yet. No, the Opera House has recently been renovated, and I think you'll be impressed when you see what's been done. But before the grand reveal, we wanted to show you what it took to restore this community treasure. Ohio has 88 county seats. Most of them are pretty historic communities. And we are visiting one of the more historic today in Mount Vernon, the seat of Knox County, where there's been a lot of recent investment to improve the community, to get a historic opera house up and running in good condition. I haven't been to Mount Vernon in a while. I'm really looking forward to seeing what's going on here today. Justin. Good to see you. How are you? Very well, thank you. Well, I've been wanting to see this place. It's, I've been hearing about it for years, and finally I'm here. So tell me about the Woodward Opera House. Well, we're standing in the annex portion mm -hmm. of the Opera House right now. Um, the Woodward Opera House is actually on this side of uh -huh. the building, and the annex is from here down to 111 South Main. Each floor has a promenade that ties the two buildings together. It's actually a really good day that you came because they're hanging the replica stencil wallpaper today in the building. It's actually paper that oh. was here that was stenciled before, but now is paper. Okay, so it was a painted stencil on it the plaster walls. Yeah. And I, I noticed you've got the, the historic wood ceiling, the iron columns. We do. It's like a historic stairway. The stairway actually is not historic. It is, uh, has been created to tie the buildings together. Before these two buildings were joined, okay. there weren't fire safety access or... Codes were different, yes, that's right. Yes, exactly. So it's actually been added to the building to create a grand staircase. And all the good so, stuff is upstairs. And all the really fun stuff is right, upstairs. Let's have a look. Okay. Oh, what a great space. Yeah, it's a very rare, rare view that yeah. anyone gets to see this. You don't get to see it that they, uh, much. Come to the Opera House. So we're on the stage. We're we looking are. out into this wonderful historic Opera House. Yes. Now the building was 1851, is that right? The original building was 1851. Originally, you would have only had up to the third floor. And that would be these up, windows. Up to that, those windows, okay. yes. In the 1880s, the proscenium was raised and the fourth floor and the balcony level was put on. Uh, originally, it was called Woodward Hall, and Ebenezer Woodward actually never lived to see the, the final product. He passed before it was completed. And it, it's a classic uh, theater space, so it's a, it's a level floor, and that was typical of the historic opera houses theaters. They tended to have level floors in yes. those days. This space did not have a permanently raked floor. Uh, we thought we would put one in, and then the conversation started to, well, what else could we use this space for as opposed to just theater performances, arts, and we decided that having a flat floor made it a lot more multi-purpose. You Makes could have sense. a wedding or a conference or a dinner theater. So how long was it actually used as a theater? Was it continuous? No, we believe there hasn't been a performance in over 100 years. Um, 100 years? Yes. <laughs> Some well, of the fun things that have happened in here, though, uh, at one point they used it as a basketball court. For a while, one of the local clubs had it as their lodge. A pigeon refuge for oh, a very long but time. Of course, yes. Yes. So it, it had its uses. It was yes. it was still a functional space, but it wasn't a theater. So, yes, it wasn't. so once you're open again, there will be performances for the first time in a very long time. Yes, in a very very long time. Well, yeah. speaking of that opening again and so on, when when did things start here? When did did the sort of the rescue of the building begin? The building itself was purchased in the late 1990s, and then the annex portion that was purchased two years later. 
uh, because the community realized that there was no way you could open the opera house without any support space. But that's, you were very smart about that, recognizing that the, the needs of a theater from the 19th century and from a 21st century are, are significantly different. You were lucky you were able to get yes. the extra building. You made it made the whole thing feasible. How did the fundraising go? I mean, obviously, it, just, it takes some money to get this done. What did you do for fundraising? We've been very lucky that we've had a good amount of local support that helped purchase the building, that helped do some of the initial restoration. But what really has led to the success of the project is historic and new market tax credits, both uh -huh. federal and state. As many big projects, yes. it's kind of a hybrid funding program, but the community showed its seriousness in yes. the beginning by coming up yes. with necessary funding to get partway. To get, yes. That gave reassurance to other funders that they were buying into mm -hmm. something that really was going to yeah. last. Yeah. And would you say that this project is, is an anchor for what else is going on in, in downtown Mount Vernon? I really do think so. There's going to be food services on the first floor, and then you've obviously got some office space. And we think that bringing in people, not only just local entertainment, but outside entertainment, mm -hmm. is going to fill up the restaurants and the shops mm -hmm. and all of the great eateries and, and art galleries and whatnot that are downtown. Mm -hmm. So we really see this as an economy booster. I think you've been very smart about that and also about uh, using spaces in the building to generate your own revenue on a steady basis. Mm -hmm. This is a great view from here on the stage. It's a wonderful theater, and, and I know you're not done up there, but I'd really like to get a look at what you have up there as well. Can we do that? I think we can go up there. Yeah. All right, yeah. let's do it. Let's do that. All right, let's go. Oh, yeah, this, another great view. So we're up in the balcony. Yeah. You can see the historic railing. And then all through here, this all this is all new construction. It is. So you've changed what the balcony arrangement was? It was flat originally? It was flat originally. The reason for the change, again, is safety codes right. regulations. So right. one it's of the here. great features up here actually is the chandelier. That's a replica of the original chandelier, but it would have been gaslit. Were there photos of the original that you worked there from? There were or? a couple photos, okay, and so they were helped. very, very old and really hard to see, so it was pretty amazing what they were able to do. Yeah. And then the ceiling medallion? That's a replica as well. Again, from an old photo, Again, you probably knew what photo. it looked like. Yes. And it looks like it has, what, stars and floral designs. And, and there's actually um, instruments in oh, the center area where the, okay. where the gold is. Yes. Okay. Well, thanks so much. This has been a great visit. I have not been here before. I'm glad I have now. You're making great progress with a wonderful preservation project, but designed in a way that makes business sense, and that's how you save historic buildings. So many thanks. So what do you think? This is magnificent, right? Right, I think I'd describe it as a masterpiece. Absolutely, and here in Mount Vernon, masterpieces come in all sizes and materials. Let's take barns, for example. Some of these once grand structures are being transformed by a company right here in Mount Vernon that values historic construction, green construction, and creative solutions. I was aware that these great old 19th century timber frame barns were going away very quickly. I just felt called to leave my law profession of 30 years to go and save as many of these barns as I could. Ohio had the best barns ever created in the history of the world because our first growth timber, the oak, the chestnut, the beech, this is a really great example of a probably 1840 to 1860 hand-hewn timber frame. It's made out of mostly oak. The trees were cut down by hand. You can see the axe marks where they were hewed with broad axes to square them up. The timbers are joined together with mortise and tenon and then held with a wooden peg. 
These were erected by hand with simple tools and a lot of manpower. The double tie beams are a beautiful feature that was just extra work, but gives this barn the strength it needs. It's very large for a hand-hewn timber frame. And we'll come in and we'll take all of the wood off of the timber frame, and then we will tag every one of these timbers and we'll do measured drawings and then indicate on the drawing which timber goes where so that when we take it apart and it's just a big pile of timbers, we'll be able to pick those up and look at the tag and look at the drawing and figure out where those go because when we put it back up, we want it to look exactly like it does now. Any wood that's worth salvaging that we can, can get out without breaking it, we'll find a use for it. Look at that board, that's, that's gotta be 14 inches wide. Uh, that would make a great uh, tabletop. The upper part of the barn is called the upper carriage, and this is the lower carriage. This was a bank barn, it's built into the side of a hill, and the lower level was to uh, keep the livestock. And that's why the ceiling's not so high. But the biggest, hugest timbers are always down in the lower level of these bank barns. And this is one of the more magnificent undercarriages that I've ever seen. This is a carrier beam here. It's 12 by 12 white oak. And it's supporting 70 of these huge sleepers. These are over 40 feet long and they're just hewed on two sides, but these are magnificent trees. We get these great old barns that are really obsolete for modern farming. You don't store hay in them anymore. You don't thresh wheat in them. And most of the big farm machinery is too big to fit in them. So to make them last, they have to be relevant for the 21st century. So we turn most of these into homes or party barns or public event spaces. And to do that, we have to turn them into conditioned space. We'll have to put the timber frame up and basically build a house around it. This is a barn that we moved and reconstructed on our property. It's a bank barn built probably 1810, 1820. This is the lower level. This is where the livestock would have originally resided. We actually raise the height of the ceiling to give us more room. Typically, the uh, lower level of a bank barn is going to be about seven feet of headroom, and this is about nine. We get salvage uh, from around Ohio. That's a neat old sink that came out of a school up in Cleveland. That uh, soapstone uh, top on the island came out of a uh, high school science classroom up in Cleveland. We made the cabinets uh, in our cabinet shop. Here's a, a a bathroom uh, that we put in and it has a reclaimed chestnut vanity. Why don't we go upstairs and uh, I'll show you the really neat part of this barn. So welcome to our party barn. It's got massive 12 by 12 inch posts and beams. It's insulated on the outside of what you see. These floorboards actually were Joyce that came out of the St. Mary's uh, School down in German Village. This is a, a really great uh, smaller barn. It's about 30 by 30. This was originally up near Genoa, near Lake Erie, and we brought it uh, down to Central Ohio and re-erected it and turned it into this really cool house. We added some uh, reclaimed elements. This is an old a uh, steel cart. It was probably from a factory up in Cleveland, and we made it into a kitchen island. The stone fireplace is probably the most imposing feature in the room. It's about 25 feet tall, and it has a, a hand-hewn timber mantle. These are, are magnificent works of art. They're handmade sculptures. I think it's a lesson in self-reliance that we need to be reminded of. I think it's also a lesson in community. One person, one family couldn't have built this. And I think in this incredibly divisive time in our country's history, we're well served to remember that we worked together at one time to build this barn, to build this country. 
Thanks for being with us. And remember, you can catch all of our episodes at columbusneighborhoods.org. Plus, see our stories on the WOSU mobile app. And you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll see you back here next week on Columbus Neighborhoods. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by. At American Electric Power, we've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarters city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State Auto Insurance Companies, transforming to become a digital provider of auto, home, and business insurance. And for nearly 100 years, committed to the people and neighborhoods of Central Ohio. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation. Smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri. Your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated. It just needs to be right. CODA. Keeps our community moving forward. Falgren Mortine Marketing and Communications. Think wider. Ohio Health focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities. Women in Philanthropy at Ohio State. Changing lives by giving together. And by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you.